Is intermittent fasting gonna give you a heart attack? Recent studies suggest that despite all the benefits that people are getting, there is a major problem here that we don't fully understand that is linked to up to a 91% higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. No exaggerations here. The study's lead author, Victor Wenzhejong, is baffled, stating it's not clear why his research found an association between time-restricted eating and a risk of death from cardiovascular disease. With at least a decade of praising fasting for not just weight loss, but benefits for insulin sensitivity, lowering inflammation, focus and mental clarity, increasing growth hormone, and yes, ironically, even improving heart health. People are rightly panicked. But with the media frenzy in full swing and the headlines getting crazier and crazier, it needs to be asked. Are they telling the full story? And if not, what are they hiding? I am a big fan of fasting. It is a tool that I believe in very, very strongly, but we need more than just surface level scares. So today, we're not just gonna scratch the surface here. We are going deep. We're going to dissect, debate, and decode the truth behind intermittent fasting. This took me about 15 hours of research to really feel sure about what I'm gonna tell you today. And honestly, there is still one huge issue here that I haven't been able to explain. So is it truly the secret to longevity or is each skipped meal chipping away at your life? My name is Andrew with Holistic Motion. Let's get into it. Episode 74, everybody. In Health Watch, intermittent fasting is a popular intermittent diet trend that fasting. can help you lose weight. It finds that it Suzanne may nearly double the risk of dying from intermittent fasting about five years ago to manage her menopausal weight gain. I eat for eight hours and then fast for 60. Fast for 60. When did intermittent fasting become a thing? If you're watching this right now, I can confidently say one thing about you. You have either tried fasting or you know somebody who has. Think back to the first time that you ever heard about intermittent fasting as a tool for health. Maybe 2020? Earlier, if you were really on the cutting edge of stuff, I heard about it back in 2014 or so because a buddy of mine, Glenn, wanted me to do a case study for him. I was just a skinny little guy and uh, I had a had some newbie gains and heard increased growth hormone levels and was sold. Object to the test! Statistically speaking, most people didn't hear about it until 2020 though, according to some Google search trends. Think of how we define intermittent fasting versus just starving yourself or disordered eating, generally speaking. It is intentional and has some parameters. You wouldn't look at a prisoner of war, for example, and go, oh, that guy takes his intermittent fasting really seriously. Yet the data points proposed in this research state that they have people following time-restricted eating protocols all the way back in 2003. Did fasting exist? Of course. It's been a part of most cultures and religions for a variety of reasons for as long as humans have existed. But again, intention here matters because how we define this matters. I'll talk about this more at the end of the video, but my childhood best friend, Patrick, was doing intermittent fasting all the way back in 2005. More on that later, but that is gonna help us make sense of all of this. All of the clues are coming together. I'm gonna frame this up for you so you have a better idea of what we're working with, but you can skip to this timestamp if you're familiar with the research and just wanna hear it interpreted. This data comes to us from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, tracking around 20,000 US adults averaging 49 years old with an average of eight years and a maximum of 17 years of data collected per person. From 2003 to 2018, participants who were evenly split between men and women provided two 24-hour self-reported dietary recall questionnaires within their first year of the study. That is one spot where this starts to get a little bit tricky. Memories fade and what we think we ate can be different from reality. One study in 2020 found that some people were underreporting their protein intake by 47%, which is pretty high, but the generally accepted range is that people can be off by 20 to 50%. And while this isn't the main topic, it is a not so fun fact that even those Apple watches and other wearables are also on average off by 15 to 25%. The most common response to this I've seen is, well, being correct about an amount of something is different than the absolute of did or did not eat, which I had considered. Of course, people often don't realize that certain things have calories or they're just 
grazing and eating like a handful of trail mix or a coffee with some extra cream in it here and there. For breakfast, we'll do something cool like have a cigarette and like a bar of chocolate. But also, people just have awful memories. 43% of eyewitness testimonies have been overturned by the Innocence Project with DNA information. Or think about things like the Mandela Effect, for example. I digress. Another problem here is that it didn't factor in other health influences that would be relevant to this. It doesn't throw all of this into question, of course. Every study, no matter how robust, will have limitations due to time and resources. So let's hop into the specifics that might change how you view intermittent fasting. According to the study, people who confined their eating to less than eight hours a day faced a staggering 91% higher risk of cardiovascular death. That is not a number that you can easily ignore. It's over 9,000! 9,000! But keep in mind that the most common fasting window doesn't have you eating in a period of less than eight hours. Most people doing this follow the 16 to 18 window. Zhang does address this also. We were surprised to find that people who followed an eight hour time restricted eating schedule were more likely to die from cardiovascular disease. They actually found up to 66% greater risk. Even though this type of diet has been popular due to its potential short term benefits, our research clearly shows that compared with a typical eating time range of 12 to 16 hours per day, a shorter eating duration was not associated with living longer. However, they also found that an eating duration of more than 16 hours per day was associated with a lower risk of cancer mortality among people with cancer. That seems at odds with a major element of longevity though. If you're eating in a window greater than 16 hours, that means your sleep window is less than eight hours. I talk more about diets and cancer in episode 71, by the way, which is linked up top, but the way Zhang talks about this, he almost seems frustrated with the data because he seems to be aware that sometimes the short-term benefits will be what help people to create long-term changes. Even if this is bad in the long-term as claimed, it might be the spark that lights the fire to get your body into an overall healthy place because he also makes a crucial point about the need for personalization in dietary advice, especially for those individuals with pre-existing conditions. He also urges caution and emphasizes tailoring diet plans to one's individual needs and the latest research but to add another layer to this, Christopher D. Gardner, PhD, points out some significant gaps in this study. Some obvious, some not so much. He questions the nutritional quality of the diets and suggests that the lack of data on what exactly participants are eating might skew these findings. For example, yes, if you follow an intermittent fasting diet and that puts you into a calorie deficit, you will lose weight, which is great, and it will improve most of your health markers. But if you're still slamming mostly processed food, it's going to be far from ideal. He also raises concerns about how the categorization into different fasting windows was based on two days of dietary intake, which hardly seems enough to draw far reaching conclusions. That's like having a kid drive a car two blocks and then going, yeah, that's good and giving them a license. But this I think is Gardner's most interesting point. He calls for a deeper examination into whether the groups with the shortest eating windows had unique characteristics like weight, stress levels, or traditional risk factors that might predispose them to worst outcomes. If you've followed me for more than a month, you know how hard I ride for individual needs for individual people. So this brings us back to a vital point, the complexity of human health and the importance of context. Intermittent fasting isn't a one size fits all solution. And while it can create significant changes for some, it could pose risks for others. But I gotta be honest about something here, guys. I didn't want to release this video for one major reason. Unfortunately, I just kept seeing more and more people making more content, piggybacking off of this with more and more unhinged takes. But this study, this is just an abstract. This hasn't been peer reviewed. This limits how much we can rely on these methods and conclusions drawn. That's a big deal because it means other experts haven't yet verified the study's findings or methodology. I don't even know what that means. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. It's no wonder that the lead researcher is tiptoeing this topic. He even realized it's got quite a few snags. My honest guess is that when the full details of this study are released, the worry around it will drop dramatically. 
my gut tells me that these collection methods just simply aren't strong enough to make any real diagnostic changes or prescribe anything different for people. But let's talk why these outcomes might be presenting. This is being presented as a study on fasting, but as I said in the beginning, fasting didn't really hit the mainstream until the mid 2010s. So what is most likely here? Were those early fasters really aiming for different health benefits? Or is it more likely that their fasting was not a health driven choice, but perhaps just a result of the lifestyle that they were living or even a disordered eating pattern? I actually found a pretty funny comment that agrees with this. So basically, they took a bunch of workaholics who ate irregularly and called them intermittent fasters. That story with Patrick I mentioned covers some of this too, but like I said, that's for later. Another critical angle here is reverse causality. Could it be that people with existing heart conditions or poor eating behaviors are more likely to try restrictive diets like short-term fasting? Think of it like this. Look at the average female CrossFit athlete after a few years of training. Usually pretty large traps, pretty wide lats. Does that mean that CrossFit creates growth there? Partially, yes. But also the people who tend to stay with the sport are the ones who do it well. And the ones who do it well also tend to be genetically predisposed to that kind of growth in those areas. And Zhang also touched on this, but while the long-term benefits of time-restricted eating on mortality and cardiovascular health are still unknown, this isn't uncommon with new health strategies. Somebody on the cutting edge has to be taking some of these risks when we don't know the outcomes. Usually the early anecdote from people is what directs science where to go and where to start poking. What we do know is that intermittent fasting can and does help with weight management for many, largely because it simplifies calorie restriction. With all of the clients that I take, I have not a single care about how they want to handle their nutrition as long as it moves them in a positive direction. If fasting helps them with calorie management and nutrition compliance, I love it, period. Here's a real life example from me that brings this all together. It is maybe 2005 or 2006. I'm 13 or so. I've been awake all night playing Star Wars Battlefront with my best friend, Patrick. My mom's out of town, so I get to stay at his place. Side note, these were seriously the best times. I really, really miss these sleepovers with uh, galactic conquest marathons. You know, I can't remember the last time I stayed up playing games all night with friends. But anyway, I wake up, wake up. and I pour a bowl of Reese's Puffs with some low fat milk. Patrick, on the other hand, grabbed his backpack and he was ready to go and head to school without eating anything. And I remember he does this and I'm hearing in my head people going, oh, you always need to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. That's what gets your body going. So I, I always did. Unfortunately, it was almost always cereal or oatmeal or malto meal or something like that until I was probably 17 or so. Oddly enough, as I'm writing this, I actually remember that in the mornings, Patrick was always more alert and kind of composed in those classes. Meanwhile, I was crashing hard. If you saw Patrick and I side by side, you would probably assume that I was the one who was fasting given how incredibly underweight I was. This is just a two person sample size, but people often look toward fasting as a trick for weight loss, while others say that eating all of your meals is the key. The truth, at least for us, is that we both show the inverse of what you would expect. And if that were the only data point we would appear to be breaking laws of thermodynamics. The reality is that I was eating a very small lunch and a very small dinner while I convinced myself that I was eating a ton. Patrick, on the other hand, was more of a snacker and a grazer. So a handful of calories here, some more calories there. All throughout the day, it would more or less go unnoticed, but that starts to add up. I remained very skinny. He remained slightly overweight. But if we had those 24 hour self-reporting questionnaires, it would likely line up with the results that this study shows, despite the reality being much different. I was blind to the lack of calories that I got and Patrick was blind to the excess. The actual benefits of compliance that many get from this will vastly outweigh the concerns explained in this article if they are true. But still, as the author even says, we can't pull any conclusions from this as all we see is a vague outcome with no clear causal reason behind it. So is skipping meals cutting short your life, or is it the key to longevity? The answer might just depend on who you are and how you fast, and what method is easiest for you to achieve your goals. But I want to know what you guys think. 
If you've tried intermittent fasting, did you find it useful or did you hate every second of it? Furthermore, if we're only getting half-truths and fear-mongering about fasting, despite centuries of it being done, what else are we getting half-truths about? Toss a comment down below. Make sure to check out holisticmotion.com for more. Until next time, guys, my name's Andrew with Holistic Motion. See y'all later. 50 Swear. pounds. How long does it take you for you to lose 50 pounds? I can pounds? lose it really quick. I could fast and lose it. Seriously, I can lose it in... I could, I could lose it quick. Like how many weeks for 50? I could do it in a month. What? <laughs> that Dude, sounds so less, insane. Less than a month. I could do really? it less than, yeah. 50 pounds? Um, I, That's I, amazing. I can do it fast. Fasting, just not, you know, but that's eating you nothing. must feel like shit, though. No. Right? One study in 2020 found that some people who were, one study in 2020 found that some people who were under, oh my God, okay. One study in 2020 found that some people were, were Jesus. <laughs> one study in 2020 found that, one study in 2020 found that, hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. Check out episode 71 linked up top, or for another video like this one, click the bottom one to see what I've been up to lately. See ya.